Welcome to Encounter Grace, where we come face to face with God's work in the world for our good. Join host Jason McKnight as we explore practical issues of community, theology, and leadership in everyday life. Welcome to Encounter Grace. I'm Jason McKnight, and I'm so glad you're with me. We have a great conversation today. Here we are thinking Christians, encountering God's grace in the world, and I'm here in the studio with Ron Capel and Sandra Hardy, this couple that God has brought together and brought to the body at Grace and ministry here in Eastern North Carolina. They're both involved in a ministry called NC Cure. And so we're going to talk about that together, this outreach they're involved in, a very hard place in our society. And I hope that as you listen, maybe you're driving down the road or folding laundry or Uh, going for a run. I hope that as you listen or watch, you'll learn a little bit and be touched and gain some hope for God's work in our world for our good. Well, Sandra and Ron, welcome. Hey there. Thank you. Thank you. We are so glad to be with you today. Let me ask you this. Let's just start the ball rolling. Uh, NC Cure. Sandra, you're the executive director of NC Cure. That's correct. And uh, I guess Ron is the bottle washer. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the chairman of the board. board. Oh, chairman of the board. Uh, Old blue eyes. Uh, Well, tell us what is is NC Cure. Well, NC Cure stands for, the cure part, Citizens United for Restorative Effectiveness. Okay. That's a mouthful. That's why we call it Cure. (laughs) And it is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. It began in um, 07, 2007, and it's an advocacy group. We advocate for the humane treatment of people in North Carolina state prisons. Advocacy group for humane treatment of the people inside of... Inside the prisons. Prisons and the state prisons. In the state prisons. Those run by North Carolina. Okay, great. That's correct. Yes. So what we hope will happen, our vision, is that our state will rebuild, resource, and restore these Mm. individuals so that they are prepared to enter the communities. So that's our vision. Yep. You know, but our day-to-day work is this um, advocating for individuals and for them as a whole group. Mm. So it started in 07. Yes. And how long have y'all been involved? (laughs) Uh, I got involved in maybe three years when uh, I left Kairos and got involved with NCQ. I'd heard about it uh, from prisoners are talking about what it was. I didn't really understand it, but I, mm. as I checked into it, I realized it's a really worthwhile organization. Mm. And then I got on the board of that uh, NCQ and uh, I've been there ever since. So. Great. And, and I only started in October of 2020. Right. 2020. So, so short f- time. Yeah, 14 months year. ago or mm-hmm. 15 months ago. Right. Wonderful. Okay, so advocating for prisoners, uh, for people who are in the prisons, how do you find out about them? Or how do you know about them? Or, you know, just describe a little bit of how it goes. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we, we put out, a, we published a, a newsletter called On the Wire. Okay, and, On the Wire. Uh, we publish it quarterly, and we has, it has all kind of good information and little, little good helpful tips to them. And and mm-hmm. uh, things about faith and so forth. And uh, so you publish this inside the prisons. Well, we give it. We, we publish it here. We and mail then, it. And it's, it's yeah, but mailed. you mail it to we prisoners. Mail it oh, to, okay. Uh, to it's about seven hundred member people who are members. Right. They have to request it. They have to request it. So and then it goes okay. to them as individuals. Yeah. And they become members of Insecure. But when that I got gotcha. you. When mm-hmm. that uh, newsletter gets in there, you might send it to one person, but I swear to you, there's ten or twelve read it, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. it's just po- it's goes through the entire prison system. Wow. And uh, it really gets has a big impact. So we get a lot of letters. We get about 100 letters a month wow. back in that. And the prisoners talk to us about what's happening there. Mm-hmm. Right. And they really, they really mm-hmm. <laughs> tell us the truth, what's going on. Mm-hmm. And that, that, resp- that response is, uh, brings a lot of uh, interaction with prisoners. Right. And, and also, that also allows us to get back in touch with staff people at NCDPS and with right. maybe out, outside people. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, yeah. it's really a big, big uh, source of, of information. You know, one, I would say that one thing that Sandra didn't say about us, yeah. the advocacy group, NCCURE is the only advocacy group that uh, acts on behalf of NC North Carolina prisoners, the only one. There's okay. nobody well, else that does it. 
So that is that is that's our sole purpose. Right. Whose sole purpose? Uh, Whose sole purpose is mm-hmm. to to care about those people behind the bars mm-hmm. so and take their up family their members. cause. Yeah. So right. we become we become their voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. so that's what we say in the newsletters, and our, the letters we get back will sometimes be just tell me more about mm. this piece of information, yeah, or help me find a place to live when I get out, or. Um, I got attacked mm. on such and such a day. Can you help me with this? Mm. You know, those kind or I my medical care is inadequate. Tell you know such and such is happening. Right. So um, we get all kinds of a variety of uh, and and about thirty a month wanting to get our newsletter. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know. So. Because they're finding they're finding worth in that mm-hmm. uh, in what what comes out. <clears throat> um, so yeah. your your goal is not. Uh, uh, maybe, and I'm, I hope I'm not doing this wrong, because uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm trying to get it straight. Yeah. Your goal isn't so much, like it, maybe your posture is coming alongside the individual who reaches out to you and the problem they're in the middle of and taking up their cause, as opposed to saying, hey, let's start from a system-wide thing and say we got to have better, or am I? Well, no, so... Remember, we've only been here for yeah. a year. So, um, so when we have started and we gathered our board, we said, "Okay, we're going to pay attention to what's going on. We're going to learn oh, what's good. going on behind the walls, and we're going to advocate for in- individuals." Our goal, however, is to um, to increase cha- change public awareness, mm-hmm. change the public opinion about what's going on, mm-hmm. and therefore. Uh, promote new policies or practices. Right, and of course, to do that, you got to learn. And so we've so got to learn. So you're in the learning segment. Now they did, good. and so yeah. in the past, in France, in um, the previous executive director had more experience, mm. and so she worked on things with um, uh, treatment of the mentally ill. Right. With some uh, Americans with Disability Act. Uh, policies that mm-hmm. were not being followed in the prisons. So she was able to work on various um, uh, practices and policies. Right. And we just haven't gotten quite there, but we are moving into it this year, <laughs> right. which yeah. um, we want to tell you about. Mm-hmm. Why don't you tell, her, tell them about our thoughts about um, oversight? Yeah. yeah. Well, <clears throat> if, if I'm, I've been involved with prison ministry for 30 years, and if mm-hmm. I would say there's one, if there was one thing I'd like to see happen, truly happen to the North Carolina prisons is I would like to see an independent oversight committee, mm. something that where people from the outside have the ability to roll into prison at any time and see what's going on and report it yeah. to whoever. That doesn't happen because uh, there's a cloak of, uh, mm-hmm. of darkness that's mm-hmm. inside prison and the, the word doesn't get out. We're, in, we're probably in there more than anybody else, but we still don't even have a first clue mm-hmm. right. about what's happening, truly happening. Mm-hmm. So that's a really important thing. So. Mm-hmm. What, I mean, what are the conditions in our state prisons? Like, and I know that they probably vary, but from what to what? Um, <clears throat> they're not good, let's put it that way. Mm. Um, Let me say that <laughs> the attitude of um, administration down to the guards in the, in the individual facilities is punishment and security mm. and maybe a little um, touch of rehabilitation yeah. so okay. it's not it's punishment it's security and so they are just crammed in there and right. kept away and not treated mm. many times as people as, people. as humans which is what we're about mm-hmm. so um for instance um you know, the only way they deal with discipline, and you know, if you put a Bunch thirty thousand people. <laughs> people in fifty five. I mean, there's yeah, crowd them in prisons. There's going to be some there's tension. Be trouble. Um, the only way they discipline is solitary confinement. Mm. Okay, they call it restrictive housing. Mm. So anytime anybody says the wrong word, disobeys an order not to pick up a piece of trash, the, their choices are only okay. You're going down into the hole. Right, that right. can go from five or six hours to cool off. Mm-hmm. That we do hear a little of that, but it can be months, sometimes up to 14 months. And what that means is they're in a secluded uh, cell 
for 22 to 23 hours a day mm. and like three times a week told you can come out and take a shower right. or you can walk around outside you know with only with other people that are you know very mm -hmm. it's just very restricted and in those situations they can't even talk to their family members they right. can't make use the phone so i mean th th so punishment and security as a as a mindset with very little rehabilitation right. that's an interesting like for me as an outsider who's new to this really i mean you know Oh, you're right. I mean, because there, there is this, this, okay, you're paying your debt to society because it's prison. It's people who have been convicted right. and security. You got to keep them safe and society safe. But rehabilitation, there's got to be hope. Right. And what else would you add? Like to say, hey, okay, lessen punishment, security, not, not be bleeding hearts, <laughs> but, exactly. but not be so focused on that. Raise the heart for rehabilitation. What else would you add to that? to make it a, even a fourth or a fifth part of their rubric of the administration? Well, I would, I would, I would say that uh, <clears throat> the prison system does their best to try to keep people from communicating to the outside. Mm. The very fact that, you, that we could write a letter yeah. or that our family can do a phone call or, or write a letter is tremendously uplifting to a, to a prisoner because he, he doesn't get any outside involvement with, at all. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that's very uplifting. I'm, yeah. One of the things that always I write a I write a lot of letters to prisoners. I've been doing it for years and years. You really have. I know. As and, long as I've known you. And, and um, it's really it's really uplifting to me to get a letter back and say I'm so glad you wrote to me and that you care for me that you really you truly Ron you really 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 listen to what I have to say mm -hmm. and that really means a lot to a person because that mm -hmm. that shows a, that that person has a worth that yes. they're, they're really worth something and. Uh, mm -hmm. The prison system doesn't allow that. And it doesn't allow that, right? Exactly. Right. And, and it, oh, go ahead. I, I just want to say it's well yeah. documented that the, a primary um, um, cause or a factor associated with reduced recidivism, that mm -hmm. is not coming back, yep. is contact with family and friends. Really? Yes. Yeah. So that's simple. So it's that simple. Right. So there is a visitation, but it's very limited. Mm. Phone calls are limited. Mm -hmm. um, Fifteen minutes, and this thing goes. Yeah, put in more money, right. kind of thing. Um, right. So, um, and you know, especially right now during the COVID, this COVID pandemic, they have not had contact. Mm. Um, it's very hard for family members to to reach them. Or f and then you add this disciplinary mm -hmm. hearing in there in, some, <laughs> in restrictive housing, so many yeah. of them yeah. that, I mean, social contact is, is really important and um, needs to be promoted. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is really promoted. This is really good to hear. This is really good to learn. So well, thank you for for opening your hearts to, to folks behind mm -hmm. bars and then opening our minds as well mm -hmm. and our, our hearts. Jason, something's happened very recently that really makes it a lot worse. Um, you used to be able to write a letter and or send. Let's say you're let's say you're a man that's in prison with a with all a family of kids at home, and they they write a Christmas card or a birthday card or something. It comes in all cute little notes and color coloring and so forth that's on it. It's a really it's a really uplifting thing yeah. to an inmate. Well, they made a change in the in the guise of it being to to slow down the traffic of drugs, which I I don't really believe that part of it. But they they put this thing in so there's all the letters, all the correspondence now goes through a, an outside source that digitizes a letter. Mm. And so now it goes, gets shipped down to an to a inmate as a digitized, digitized call, you know, Xerox of something with no color. It's just drab and Ugh. it's just terrible. And uh, it's a mm. really, it's a big, big downer for inmates. I mean, it's a huge downer. Yeah. And besides that, I think it's illegal. But uh, we haven't. Well, that that's has, why you're advocating. Doing it in that, many hasn't, states. <laughs> that hasn't been tested yet, but I'm sure it's going to be, mm. because all everything that gets sent into a prisoner gets put in a vault at uh, at this location, and and just a copy gets sent, wow. which is really. Mm. The same thing well, it's pictures. dehumanizing. It's just oh, dehumanizing. Totally, yeah, pictures totally are not dehumanizing. That's right. Mm -hmm. Allowed. Can't yeah. get in there. In there. Well, I, I even remember when I would visit people in the in the little jail here, the jail, not the prison, but the jail. Mm -hmm. And you'd, you'd sit across from each other on the phone, but right. there was the, the glass. And then when they built the new detention center, and now you're just looking at a TV screen, and they're somewhere on another floor, and you just don't even have... 
Right. That that thought that you're seeing someone here. You're it, exactly it right. Just, I mean, they honestly they could be in Romania. Like right. it just you know. And it's so dehumanizing. Right. It it okay. is, and that that is exactly what I thought as I left that day. I and mm-hmm. and it's interesting. Security, instead of instead of Sounds rehabilitation or human humanization. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about you guys for just a second. Like how um, you've been. You've had prisoners on your heart for thirty years, and you've. Sandra been um, drawn in to to this, uh, but um, when did that start for you, Ron? Like, how, why did that start for you? Well, it's a good good story because I was very involved with an organization called the Walk to Emmaus, mm-hmm. which was a it's a very well known uh, yeah. Christian ministry about pretty much about grace and discipleship. It's exactly right, and, and I did it for a long, long time, and then it got so that there were so many people that wanted to be involved with working on the, an Emmaus team, I said, well, I'll just sort of back out. And I, I sort of backed away from Emmaus for a long time, and then all of a sudden I heard about this thing called Kairos. Mm. And, what is Kairos? And I, I found out that it was Emmaus behind bars. Wow. And we were, we were told it's Emmaus on steroids. <laughs> and, that re- and truly, that's what it is. But uh, it took a long, fo- long time for it to come to, to be fruition. And I ended up really going around in different states and, and trying it out hmm. and came back very enthusiastic. And I actually sort of helped start the form and, and it became real. And before you know it, there were 21 prisons that were involved with it. Wow. And it's, it just took off like wildfire. Hmm. But from the inside, if you were a, a Kairos person on the inside, it was a tremendously transforming hmm. ministry. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and I'm exaggerating. I've I've seen somewhere between 50 and 75 men come to Christ, mm. and women too. I've seen some women yeah. come to Christ, yeah. Yeah. and that's that really gets you pumped up, mm-hmm. and it shows so much more hope. And, and every time you see someone make that step to come from the sewer <clears throat> yeah. up to up to uh, Christ, mm-hmm. it is amazing, and that makes my heavenly. faith stronger and stronger each time. It's great. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And then I get. Uh, Sandra saw all the great things that I was seeing with Kairos, <laughs> and she got drawn into it. Yeah, so I got into Kairos for Women for right. a while before the um, prison close by um, was converted to a men's. Right. right. You know, so, but anyway, so I got involved there and actually spent time with four or five uh, women incarcerated in mm. small group settings. Mm. And, <laughs> oh, well, it can change your heart to hear that. Mm-hmm. It does. Hear what's going on with these women. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, how long have y'all so, been married? Going on eighteen years. Eighteen years. Eighteen years. Yeah. Wow. And it's it's, yeah. it's certainly a God thing. We were led. <laughs> we were led together by God. We 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 met on the internet. We're back in. The, we were the real internet pioneers. Yeah, I was going to say, was there an internet back yeah, then? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway. Uh, I was I'd been divorced twice and um, mm. boy I was really a, a hard I was a bad puppy and I just yeah I remember I, that. I wanted no I wanted nothing to do with women mm. and uh, I wanted to be a hunter and a fisherman and just go off with my dog and everything and anyway uh, the Holy Spirit one day said Ron that's not for yeah. you <laughs> that is not for you you need more help Ron that's right exactly <laughs> exactly so I I changed my direction and. Uh, Actually, we, we, mm-hmm. I wasn't going to go and get met by somebody that I met in a bar. or that I wanna have, I'm no, certainly not going to have you tell me that I should be dating so-and-so because you don't really know me. Right, yeah. so, right, uh, right. Yeah. Someone said, well, why don't you try the Internet? I said, what? Mm-hmm. And it says, well, Ron, what you can always do, you can always go delete, delete. Yeah, that's true. And, I, and so I, I do it that way. And I put my profile on the Internet, and sure enough, after – I got really disappointed about it, but then at the very end, I was about ready to drop it. This woman named Sandra decides to check in, and we instantly Isn't clicked. that amazing? Instantly. And yes. two years later, we got married, and now 18 years later after marriage, it's great. <laughs> wow. And we've been led by God the entire time, and mm-hmm. we continue that way. So it's not a... It's not a rule. I call him my Jesus in the skin <laughs> <laughs> because he's so supportive and he is. so loving. And, uh, yes. He and really he is. Me up and all, he's you know, special. Could you imagine if all he did was hunt and fish? Yeah. How yeah. much the poorer the world so would be? Have, exactly. <laughs> well, and how long have you been at Grace? 
just six years. We were, it we seems like it. forever. It seems like forever. <laughs> yeah. It does. We went back and counted it up, and we said, maybe six, seven years? Yeah, so, wow. six years, I think. And, and it has been the best decision we have made. Well, we just rejoice in your presence and, and you know, the influence you have in this body is, is wonderful and in the community and, and helping us. Um, you already were following the Lord when you got married. What's your story of coming to the Lord? Well, can I, my story yeah. is that, you know, I was raised in a Christian family right here in Eastern North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I went to church and did all the youth stuff and everything. Um, but... Um, I don't know. I guess I got a little bit uh, away from church with my if, as I was raising my children, which I'm forever regretful, mm, <laughs> regretful about. Sure. But um, my son got involved in Young Life when he was 16, mm. and he went off to camp, and I was really supportive of all this. Yeah. yeah. But um, he came back from one of the camp experience as a new creation. Wow. Wow. Uh, you know, he, we'd gone through a divorce. Mm. It was not an easy thing for a, a boy that age. Oh, my daughter I was a teenager, too. And so for him to come back and go, ha, huh, life is good. I had a different set of friends. <laughs> yeah. I found all these um, devotionals on the floor in his room, highlighted all these notes on it. And I'm going, man, I want some of that. Right. I want some of that. Right. And as I talked to my son, he doesn't remember this, but I was talk to him, talking to him about faith and what I thought, and he said, Mom, you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, man, I want it. Yeah, yeah. I did. So, so it just, I mean, I really feel like I, I said, well, I, I, you know, I'll start some devotions. I think I just opened up the Word, opened up my heart, and God just kind of, phew. yeah flying in. Amen. 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 <laughs> and my daughter was impacted the same way. Wow. So we are a family that is, um, you know, imp- you know, what forever grateful to God, but through the vehicle of young life. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's me. And that was when he was 16. So yeah. that's been about, um, yeah, uh, it's, he's now 30, whatever. It's about 20 yeah, years. Long, long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> 40 years. We don't have to get too precise. Yeah, that's right. That's almost 40 years, years ago. Yes. So. Wow. Well, my way was a lot longer than that. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, I got a few years on her, but. Uh, yeah. No, that's true, and you look like it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, when I was 11 years old, I was at a, I was a country church, and as traveling evangelists came by, and. I was just drawn to the altar. Nothing could keep me mm. from going to the altar At 11, and giving my life it. to Jesus, which was a very tr- traditional way of ha- something happening. Well, I did that, and I'm sure that I fought, and I, well, I was truthful in what I was saying, but, um, boy, I just slipped back quickly, and, and I, I went into a, a period of revolution mm. against my, my parents, who were wonderful people. And uh, so I had to have it my own way, and I mm. went away and got graduated from college and got married and all that, and just really had to live my own way, which was not the right way. A bunch of dead ends. Yeah, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And that, and the idea of living the American dream mm. is a big one of the biggest lies there is. Mm. That's what I was trying to do. I was really, really disappointed. I was making money and had two kids and. You know, I was li- looking in, living in suburbia and all that. Well, but I was really miserable. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So during that time, uh, there had been a lot of kidnappings of people, uh, executives that, from uh, in South America, and they would. There was a group called the Tupamaro Indians that would kidnap people and they would take them off in a jungle and they'd demand from Xerox or IBM or mm-hmm. Coca-Cola or whoever it was, you know, ransom for the to get these people out and they would give up millions of dollars to pull these people out of the jungle. Well, <clears throat> there was one guy that uh, who was kidnapped and f- he had disappeared for like six or eight or nine months and everyone thought he was dead. Hmm. So here I am in South America someplace, I don't even remember where I was now, but uh, I did my typical thing. I went out and have a big dinner and I'd, used, I'd drink too much wine or some too much booze and I'd went and wake my way back to the hotel room and then fall asleep. Well. One night, I uh, four o'clock in the morning, I had left the TV on, and 
I was awakened by this guy who uh, was in rags, and he was on his TV talking excitingly about how he had left the jungle and found Jesus Christ in the jungle, and he escaped from the Tupamaros, and he was going back to Ohio and giving wow. his life back to trying to rescue his uh, marriage with his wife and kids. And, man, I listened to him. I listened to him. I said, well, Ron. That's exactly who you are. Uh, and I fell on the floor and wow. sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and, and says, Jesus, I'm so sorry that I've lived such a terrible life. I'm, I'm coming back to you. Please help me. Please forgive me. Isn't and that that's amazing? what happened to me. And I've, from that point on, that's the last trip I ever took overseas uh, for a corporation. And uh, I've spent all my time trying to re resurrect my life with my children and my mm. wife. And... Uh, that's where I stand. And I haven't wow. left that. And that's 47 years ago. We counted wow. that. And uh, I've not. Isn't that amazing it how was, the Lord worked differently in both your lives? 11 and then, and then went your own way and yeah. really prodigaled. Yeah, you know, yeah, late, until late thirties, so. until you came back to your senses, as Luke 15 says. You know, mm -hmm. when that when that son came back to his senses, right. and and he came back to his dad. Well, remember when I remember when I got dunked in the Baptized. thing down here. Baptized. Baptized. <laughs> um, I said that day that, that that was a real baptism. I was baptized when I was 11 or 12, mm. but I didn't even know what baptism was. Yeah. Right. But right. when I truly understood mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. Jesus was and what he meant to me, and then, then got yeah. a second chance, that was a, that was a true baptism. Yeah, amen. And that's, it means a huge difference. So. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, both, but, but your story of, of, but then also, Sandra, yours of your son bringing you to Christ because you saw Christ in him. What right. a joy. What a joy. <laughs> I, mean, I just, I, you know, it never, the way God works it never fails to surprise me and delight us okay. because I think that's what he loves. I think that it's going to take eternity to hear everyone's story and how he used so many different things, even a kidnapped guy that no one had seen for eight months <laughs> on, well, on a TV at four in the morning. So you can imagine in prison seeing someone right. who is totally, totally deprived of anything, without mm -hmm. hope, without one iota of hope, mm -hmm. finding Jesus because mm -hmm. someone choose to love on him and he found his his person in Jesus and he just he has an incredible transformation mm. Mm. and and since I've been involved with Kairos you know in, in all these years I've those people do not change they're they're transformed and they never change from where they are right right and well how can someone get involved someone listening today okay well um prayer yeah, we can Praying pray for us all of us. Is yeah, something that um, I really believe that's a real. I mean, it was because of prayer that we got this thing going to begin with. Right. When we came on board, and um, there are volunteer opportunities, and we were talking last night. We could have more and more if we mm -hmm. had enough volunteers. Yeah. We could have people sending birthday cards and right and holiday cards. You know, Christmas, Easter, those kind of things to these uh, to our members. Mm -hmm. um, that would be so encouraging to them. We have a team that's in Concord who puts together our newsletter, right. uh, get, you know, puts it all ready and gets it ready for um, uh, distribution. Um, we could have people help us with our desktop top publishing. Mm. We publish the newsletter yep. that way. Yep. Um, we could, um, how are, um, we need to write grants. Mm. Okay, we can have some help responding to our our the letters. Yeah, I we was thinking some, that. Like Ron, you could train a bunch of people yes. how to write letters. How to, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not not, uh, but just in or, the, in the no. right way for prison. Right. I guess is what I'm saying. And the other thing is, we want to connect to more people. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like we need more work to do, but we do want to connect to more, yeah. especially to family members. So that's one thing, one way that people could really help us mm -hmm. um, is to help spread this word. Mm -hmm. um, we would love yes. to have invitations to civic groups and. Church, other church groups mm -hmm. to talk about this because again one of our missions here is to change public opinion to get people right. to really understand what's going right. on yep. so um that, that's how people now this is wonderful and, and we need money uh, yeah of course you know um we have um plans to hire an executive director hopefully in 2023 Great. um because a, a uh, 
volunteer grandmother is not who never had any experience with the criminal justice had to learn all, it's really not the best for this organization That's right. right you know i mean i've loved you're it, stepping in to to do what you can but right but we really need could use some more um so so financial support is another thing that's um, great and so, and can people get involved like is it insecure.org Yes, insecure.org. Yep. Right. And we're on Facebook and LinkedIn and and Twitter. Great. Too. And so. of course, people can reach out to us and we'll get them to you. Right. Um, because I love that. I love the idea of, you know, when someone listens to this, they can send the podcast on to their friend because their son is in prison. Exactly. And, the, and that mom can hear that you guys can be an advocate for them. Perfect. Let me look in the other direction from, from the the ground level, the people level to the system level, is mm-hmm. the system aware of you? Are the are the Department of Corrections or, or whatever it's called in Raleigh, do they know about Insecure? And, and oh, yes. Have you, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. And they, they um, uh, welcome uh, our Yes, input. good. So we've had conversations with the commissioner several times. Wonderful. Um, he has approved our newsletter and knows all about it, gets a copy of it when we send Great. it out. And there's a... Um, we know wardens, we know East regional directors, uh, medical director. We have conversations and emails with them, and they do mm-hmm. welcome. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes it's not so good to hear that something's going on. and But, uh, you know, they'll say, we can't know until someone tells us. Right. So, so, you right. know, there's a lot of difference mm-hmm. in um, what's going on in our local facilities and what people may be thinking in Raleigh. Right. So we try to help uh, with yep. that connection. So and thankfully they they recognize us and tell other people to well, pay and, attention when we and uh, they need to. Yes, right. because that's why right. there's social media. Right. <laughs> I mean, and they're responsible. They're public servants. They are. And that's we're advocating for those who are in the public. They're accountable to us. They really are. They are. And and they want to be. And 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 in their mm-hmm. right mind, they want to be. Yes. And right. I believe we have a, a fairly new uh, commissioner who has a very aggressive strategic plan. Mm. And he uh, he speaks to this, that he really wants to improve the state of our, our prisons. Wonderful. You know, so. So it's already uh, working. It's already, <laughs> yes. Yeah, Not just you I guys, so. but everyone. But you know, and, and remember, oh, um, okay. we see ourselves as a watchdog. Mm. All right, we report things. We don't know what really happens to it, but they know we're, kind of, we're watching. Yeah. Yep. And I believe that, and it's, again, there's evidence to say that when there is a watchdog in oh, the yeah. system, that it changes the behavior. So. It, it does. And, and every one of us has lived that in our lives. You, right. When the teacher leaves the room, you're more <laughs> tempted to cheat. That's right. You, you just are as a kid in eighth grade. That's yes. right. I mean, right. I was a Christian, but I was tempted to cheat too. Maybe sometimes looked. Well, that, that watchdog <laughs> yes. thing is very important. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It uh, sometimes, not not too often, but sometimes we get a, an insight that there is a really bad thing going on, maybe with gang a, yeah, a, a right. gang interaction right. that might lead to someone getting stabbed or killed or something, and we get these threats, and they're real, mm-hmm. and the the people inside prison a lot of times don't even know about these. They know that they exist, but they don't know the specifics about that. So if we hear an in, in, inkling of something happening. If we call a warden at a specific prison, they want to hear from us, mm-hmm. and that person will get yanked out and sent to another prison or something, and they stop mm-hmm. that threat right there, right. and they really appreciate that. Yeah, that's so good. The, the downside yeah. of that would be that warden having a death on his on his hands. Well, that's true. And right. So they really like, they they appreciate us contacting. Mm-hmm. Them. So that's a, that's a good thing about the watchdog for them. Well, and it it's, also, um, yeah. It also and gets involved there we we have uh, there's an organization called priya that's that the individual at handles sexual interactions mm. and um, to yeah. try to try to stop rapes and things like that yeah. yeah well we we get we hear things that have happened sexually that are that are not good yeah. and we yeah. can we can go back to the uh, to the authorities and work on that too so it's mm-hmm. it's uh, right and we ha- we collaborate with groups yeah. you know we yeah. can't do anything legally with so we, we have right. no legal resources that's not us <laughs> yeah but yeah, right. but but um when for instance that we've there's a case going on right now of sexual assaults at one of the mm-hmm. women's prison and um i've been able to kind of hand it over and then continue to communicate mm-hmm. with the director of north carolina prisoner legal mm-hmm. services it's very good you know and we're yep. we're you know working that way 
to um, get some resolution. Well, so. watchdog is one way to say it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Ezekiel might have said watchman. <laughs> <laughs> right. a, a watcher on the wall or yeah. a watchman on the it's wall. And what thing. you're doing is you're helping mm-hmm. see the rest of us citizens who, who just drive by or don't even know where prisons are. Yeah. Um, we just don't think of what's going on behind the bars. But a civilization is only as civilized as we treat those at the lowest rungs. Absolutely. And, and I hate to say lowest rungs because you're not supposed to rank, but, but these are folks that mm-hmm. are at the mercy of civilization right. at this point. Right. And so we're not a civilization of, of like, if we're, not, if we're not also extending humanity and dignity and worth, I mean, we're mm-hmm. just, we're recording this during the week of Martin Luther King Day and, and Sanctity of Life. I don't, it's going to be broadcast later, but this, yes. this whole idea of the, the dignity of every human, That's right. Martin Luther King, Sanctity of Life, same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We also say that for folks behind bars. Right. And yes, yes, they're serving their time. Right. They're, they're convicted. Right. And so we're not saying that there should be no prisons. We're saying they should be honorable. Right. And, and we right. need to find that right line. And you're at least saying we're going to offer the stories of mm-hmm. people as mm-hmm. they tell them to us. I want to bring up this yeah. idea. And that is um, that there's a dream mm-hmm. in my mind. And, and, you know, when people commit crimes, they should be separated from society and that ought to be enough mm. you know so they're protect the system should protect the public and also yeah. give an appropriate amount of punishment so but once they're there the goal should be what is it going to be like when they get out mm-hmm Right, Not, right. you know, and actually Norway and some other European com- countries have come to a, a different, totally different way mm-hmm. of approaching prison, imprisoning people. Yeah. You know, um, it's just an entirely different culture. So um, there's, I don't, California, I know, has a um, nonprofit that's working on making that happen in their mm. state prisons. And they're just beginning. It's a long, it's a long way. It would be a real change for American. Right. So we're, that's right. why oversight is our uh, a first step for us. Yeah. Whereas trying to change the whole attitude would be a different one. But, you know, doesn't that make sense? You yeah. know, get them away from us. Give them a punishment. But that doesn't mean that... That you treat them as we nothing. We treat them as yeah. nothing. Mm-hmm. And that we don't Or give in dangerous them, ways. Right. You know, and that they live in fear. Mm-hmm. And actually, you know, and, what and happens I think is it, they, turn, they become hard, more hardened criminals. Well, it becomes, it, it becomes college for criminals. You're yes, exactly. and, and we don't want that, right. and, and it, we are having that for That's generations. Right. Right. But so, yeah, and it, it shouldn't be vacation either. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, so, but I love the dream. Keep dreaming the dream. Keep right. thinking this, and there's a better way, and there we're going to be way. saying that until heaven. Exactly. But exactly. we've got to be saying that even here. Right. So, but, you know, people yeah. don't know that, no, don't. that half of the population of people in prison are there for nonviolent crimes. Mm. Yeah. Drug possession. Right, right. Statutory stuff. Embezzlement, mm-hmm. you know, theft without a weapon. Mental people, health. Mental and then they health. get, and unfortunately, they get mixed in a, a, mixed a violent in. population and then they get then trained. Then they become violent. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So no, it's true. To think that um, somebody is in there for life, and our sentencing structure right now is really awful what we have going on because you can stack sentences Mm -hmm. and the the whole three strikes are out kind of thing. So people can be in for a nonviolent crime and be um, there for 400 years. It's not life, but it's 400 years. Yeah, it's life. Uh, It's life. (laughs) Well, and and, and so that's out of the, the, that's into the legal system and and into, I mean, there's so many things at play, but what I really appreciate and, you know, kind of as we wind this up, I just really appreciate you two saying, hey, here's someone without a voice. Mm-hmm. Let's be a voice. Here's a group th- whose voice is being covered over or just just don't have the resources. And so we, as the body of Christ or as concerned citizens, can come with compassion mm-hmm. and interest and empathy and say, well, we'll at least be a friend on the journey with you. Right. And, and that's right. what I love. And I love that yes. ncure.org has many different avenues for folks uh, who are listening to this to be involved, and we can come and talk to you, Sandra and Ron, mm-hmm. and um, and I just thank you for serving our whole society by serving those who are in prison, because you you really are leavening all of it by bringing grace and compassion in one corner of it. 
And so keep at it. I, I kind of see the tears. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, um, God has to lead this way. Mm-hmm. And I think he is opening doors mm-hmm. um, everywhere for, for this ministry. And, uh, you know, we just... You know, I'm, I'm well, it's going to be great. Yeah, go ahead. I've made the comment several times that, uh, that I think that the, great, the next great revival mm-hmm. is going to come from the incarcerated. Yeah. I really believe that. Mm. I mean, it was because when you see the enthusiasm and energy a person that's led to Christ in prison has, oh my gosh, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. He becomes one who helps other people. He becomes one who protects other people inside. Yeah. Uh, he becomes one who leads others to Christ. Exactly. So, um, and and I know or I've, she. I've known a lot Amen. of them have done that. So. You really have. I love that vision. And wouldn't that just be like God? <laughs> To bring the fourth great awakening through our prisons. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you for coming and thank you just for sharing your hearts and your lives with us today in this listening community at Encounter Grace, but really with the folks and their families uh, who are in the prison system. So, Sandra Hardy and Ron Capel, ncure.org. Thank you so much for being with us. And everybody, thank you for joining us on this great episode as we think about a corner of our society that we don't usually think about. Mm-hmm. And as we hear, God is at work there and we can join him. Yes, so thanks is. so much. And we'll see you again. Thanks Ooh. for the opportunity. This is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Visit gracekinston.org or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.